Welcome everyone to our um, second discussion on the way of Jesus. You know, in the previous lecture, we discussed how what we saw from Jesus' teachings and the narrative we know about his life was that he seemed to be an individual that was sparking a revolution, a social political revolution, since he was encouraging people to look beyond the kingdom that they seemingly were embedded in, right, the Roman Empire, and to look deeper, to look further. Uh, beyond that, there is a kingdom of God, and it is uh, our relationship to that king, right, to God. It's our relationship to that kingdom, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. That's actually most important in our lives. That's most, um, that will make, that would uh, help make our lives more fulfilling, help make our lives more meaningful, help bring us back closer to the original way that God had intended us to live beyond the struggle and the hardship and the, um, the conflicts that uh, burdened the people in the region at the time. Jesus said, yeah, you, there is a life for you beyond this, right? There's a kingdom for you beyond this. So what we mentioned at the last lecture too was the fact that it wasn't just what Jesus said, but how he said it. How was it that he spread this message to um, other people? So in this way, we refer to Jesus as an enigmatic wisdom teacher, as a wisdom teacher, a teacher of wisdom in ways that were, weren't very direct or to say it differently, in ways that sometimes people don't see very clearly at first. And according to what we see in the New Testament, it seems as if this approach to teaching was very intentional. So uh, what we had for this week was um, a discussion that revolved around these, um, these parables. Uh, and uh, I hope you were able to participate in the discussion prior to coming to our, our lecture today. So let's review uh, the parables. And uh, there are several ways of looking at these parables, several ways of interpreting them. Uh, and it's very possible that there are multiple ways of, of, of peeling back layers and seeing meaning within each of these parables. So we'll just discuss them briefly, give you a starting point or a way of entry, a, uh, uh, a gate of entry into some of these parables so that maybe you can look further if you had a hard time understanding them at first. Okay. So from uh, Luke, which is another uh, uh, book within the New Testament, um, 8, 4 through 15. While a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on and the birds of the air ate it up. Some fell on rock. And when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop, a hundred times more than was sown. When he said this, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So what did you make of this parable? So uh, if, we, if you'd like, let's go ahead and start with um, some of the basics of the parable. We have the story of a farmer. Well, a farmer is somebody that grows something, somebody that grows plants, that grows a crop, that, uh, that raises animals um, in, in order to flourish, right? These are meant for us to, to be healthy, to maintain well-being. Now, how do we maintain well-being? We're told that we have to be careful where we plant our seeds. We have to be uh, careful of, of where it is we place our seeds. Um, if we are careless, we may not place our seeds in proper places that allow the seeds to flourish, to grow, to manifest into something useful that manifests in something that will allow us to increase our well-being. Uh, but where are we supposed to place our seeds? We're supposed to place it in good soil. So think about the imagery of soil. And one way of thinking about the parable is this notion that soil is, you know, below the surface. Soil is that which um, nourishes seed. It nourishes what we put into it. 
So if we think of soil in this way, soil as being that which is below the surface, soil that is the foundation from which things grow, uh, you may think of the parable as referring to, you know, our internal, um, our internal being, our internal life, and how beneath the surface we need to have good soil, that we need to have um, rich, uh, a rich inner life, so that we can grow from it, so that we can manifest from it uh, a, a healthy life, a healthy sense of well-being. I remember we talked about the notion of metanoia, uh, repentance, right? Change. And in particular, we focus on a change of heart, something internal. So one way of looking, one way of looking at the parable is a message about focusing on, on your internal well-being, focusing on um, uh, yourself from the inside. Because whatever you do on the outside of your life, if what's inside isn't, uh, healthy. If what inside isn't rich of nutrient, then we may not be able to manifest uh, a fulfilling sort of life for ourselves. Okay, just one way of looking at this parable. Let's take a look at another parable uh, from the from book of Matthew. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds come and perch in its branches. So let's go ahead and sit with the imagery again. And uh, what we're really doing is experiencing the mythos of these parables, right? What sort of experience of reality is being expressed through these parables? Well, here we're being told that the kingdom of heaven, right, this kingdom that uh, we truly belong to, according to Jesus, this kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. So immediately we see that it's kind of small. It's, it's actually really small. It's not, it's, not, it's not overt, meaning it's not easily seen. Um, and what we, we're told is that this thing that's, that starts off small can eventually grow, can eventually grow to such an extent that it's, it's something that benefits other people. It grows so large that um, it becomes a tree so that birds come and perch in its branches. So it attracts and helps and it, as a benefit to all that is around it, even though it starts soft, small. So one thing to think, too, is that seeds, just like with the previous parable, seeds belong in soil. They belong underneath the surface. So we have the sense from this parable that Jesus is referring to how the kingdom of heaven may start from inside or may exist from the inside. And that even though it starts off small, it may start as something that can't be seen. Um, that with, with what we need with seeds, with nurture and with, 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 with patience, this can grow and manifest to something that is beneficial to not just oneself, but all people, to all things around it. Well, another way of looking at this, too, is we see that the kingdom of heaven is referred to as a mustard seed, which grows, right? Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants. So it grows. The kingdom of heaven, in this sense, may be thought of as a process. Maybe the kingdom of heaven isn't a thing, isn't a place, but it's a process. It's a process by which we, we are able to... Um, uh, cultivate and uh, develop an inner life or an inner uh, sense of well-being so much so that it's able to manifest in something greater that's able to help other people. Uh, just a couple of ways of thinking about the parable. From Luke, uh, from Luke, uh, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons the younger one said to the father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. So I'm going to shorten the parable here because it's, a, it's rather long to put on a single slide. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. Now remember in the parable, what we see is the father, um, is, is the son eventually coming back and um, the father treating him uh, well, in fact, celebrating the son coming back, yet the other son who, who took care of his share of the estate, um, who 
uh, did right by his father and was responsible for what his father gave him, uh, this other son becomes a little bit jealous. You know, why were you, why are we celebrating my, my, my brother coming back when this person did something, uh, uh, did, did something that wasn't very good. That wasn't very smart. That was, um, that was kind of foolish. Yet when he comes back, we're, we're celebrating that he returns. So the father says, uh, my son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Okay, so uh, let's, let's think about what this might be saying about the way. And what is, what is the way according to this parable, right? The way of Jesus. There's a few things that you might have pointed to in your discussions, right? There is this idea that um, no matter how far we are astray, no matter how poorly our decisions are, um, if we think of the Father here as being God, then God always is there for you. God is always there to welcome you back. So think back to the, um, to the mythology of creation, right? We were born and created, man, mankind is created in this perfect environment, Eden. And we make this choice to leave, kind of like the, the foolish son in this parable. Um, but it, it's not as if God is saying, you made a bad choice, so I, I no longer like you. You made a bad choice, so you deserve to experience pain out in the world. Um, God, according to this parable, seems to be a, a being that welcomes us back, that will celebrate us coming back, that, uh, uh, that wishes for us nothing but to return back to him or to return back to our original um, state in Eden, to the original type of life that was intended for us. That's, that might be a very, um, a, a very comforting sort of thought, right? Here you are living your life and you maybe you notice you've made bad decisions and you've noticed that uh, you've been not, not so nice to people. And it's possible to develop a really strong sense of guilt and then a really, um, a really dark sense of personal worth, self-worth. And sometimes a lot of us, it's hard to transcend that. It's hard to think of ourselves as being worthy of a good life. Within the parable, we see that the way of Jesus is one that gives hope, that even though you may not have been the best person in the past, that you may not have made the right choices and decisions in the past, um, you are always welcome back, that, that nobody is unredeemable, that uh, you shouldn't see yourself as unworthy of a good life. Another way to think about this parable is to think about the two different uh, um, uh, sorts of values at play here. On one hand, we have the uh, the son who treated the father's property and estate. You know what we would think of as being, you know, uh, fair. We treat uh, the 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 son treats the property and estate in a way that's responsible. It seems like the correct thing to do. On the other side, we see this son who um, who squanders it, who, who treats the property, the estate. Uh, foolishly, uh, yet the father still still loves and, and rejoices over this son coming back. So from the from the responsible son's point of view, this seems very unfair. This seems unjust. Why should my my uh, younger brother uh, be treated so well, even though I'm the one who did right by you, father? Yet the father is still welcoming the father seems to 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 be um not really uh focused on what's fair or just in that sense instead what we see is the father is focused on compassion the father's focused on forgiveness and in in this framework what we might see this parable is talking about is the difference between what we most value do we most value being right? Do we most value being fair? Or should we more value compassion? Should we place more value on, uh, on forgiveness? I'll give you an example from, uh, from, from school. So 
uh, as a student, you've probably had the experience of turning in an assignment late, right? Something happened, there was an issue at work, there was an issue with the family, there was an unforeseen circumstance, and you had to turn in an assignment late. Now, uh, most instructors will have some sort of rule within their syllabus that says, you know, what they do with late assignments. So let's say your instructor has a rule that says no late assignments. I will not accept late assignments. So here you are, you come in and you want to turn in your assignment late, even and it's because of all these things that happen to you in your in your at home right in your home life and the just thing to do right the right thing to do may be to to abide by the rule the teacher might say look it's it's in the syllabus the rule says i don't accept late work and in order for me to be fair to everybody i have to make sure that i apply the rule the same to everyone and that's the fair thing to do that's the just thing to do but what might be the compassionate thing to do? What might be what might be the 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 more empathetic thing to do? Well, that might be uh, as a teacher to listen to you as being as a student to find out what it is you went through, and to provide some compassion and let you turn in the assignment late because of all the things you experienced. It might not be fair to other people who stayed up all night to try to get it in on time. It might not be fair to other people who sacrificed things in their life, right? Time with their family, time with friends. Maybe they left work early in order to get the assignment done. So it's not really fair to them. But in terms of compassion, it might be a compassionate thing to do for the instructor to listen to what you have to say about what you went through and then accept your paper or accept your assignment. So here we see this sort of a debate here, right? Do we value just or fairness? Do we value compassion or forgiveness? Obviously, you can value both. But we see here an emphasis on compassion, an emphasis on forgiveness. So what does it mean that this person was dead and is alive again, that they were lost and is found again? I'm sure there are several ways of interpreting this, and I'm hoping you had many in your discussions for this week. Um, but can you think of experiences in life where you felt dead? Can you think of experiences or times in your life where you felt completely lost? Or maybe you know of people who are completely dead. You know, they, they, they are, maybe not literally, but they're walking around talking, but you can see them being dead in the inside. Maybe you see them as going through their daily routine, and they're, but they're, they're lost. They don't really know what they're doing with their lives. What we see here is the notion that what's to be celebrated uh, is their return. What's to be celebrated is their rebirth, to be awakened, to be alive, to be found again. And even though... Um, them being dead or them being lost may have caused them to live life in a way that we may not agree with or to have a, a life and make choices that may have not have been very nice to other people or very respectful. That uh, No matter what they did, we should rejoice at the fact, at any, at, 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 at any example of them coming back to life. We should rejoice at any example of them being found and finding themselves in the right path again. Um, Again, we, we hear this message of forgiveness, right? Okay. Uh, from Matthew, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Well, this is interesting, right? Here is the kingdom of heaven, and it's being compared to treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. Why would you find the kingdom of heaven and then hide it again? Right? Why would you find the kingdom of heaven and place it um, within the fields, within the, the, uh, the growth of the field so that's unseen? Why would you do that? Why would you then, instead of taking the kingdom of heaven, right? Why would you put it back in the field, hiding it, and then sell everything you have in order to buy the field? Why not just take the kingdom of heaven from the field? <laughs> so once again, if we think of the field, you might want to think of soil again. Right? If we think of being hidden, we want to think of the idea that the kingdom of heaven isn't something that's maybe necessarily overt. That's easily viewed, easily seen. Instead, it might be something inside, right, hidden. It might be something that maybe even be all around you, but hidden in plain sight. 
these are lots of ways of interpreting the metaphor here. Um, so imagine you open your eyes and you see the world as normal, and you, what you might see is problems and conflict and people you don't like and stress and causes for fear and anxiety. Maybe the kingdom of heaven is hidden there, right? Maybe the kingdom of heaven is right in front of you, but it's hard to see. It's hidden in the field. When a man found it, he hid it again. So why would you see it and then hide it again? Well, maybe we can take a look at this a couple ways. If we take the approach of the kingdom of heaven being here, being uh, uh, all around you, but we just can't see it because it's hidden from our perspective, then you'd want the kingdom of heaven still to be there. You, want, you wouldn't want to take it out from what's in front of you because what's in front of you is what you deal with on a daily basis. You want the kingdom of heaven to be embedded in this, right? Another way to think about this too is if the kingdom of heaven is in a field, hidden in a field, maybe it's referring to, again, something on the inside. We can't see what's on the inside, right? It's hidden from most people's view. So if we think of the kingdom of heaven as something inside, then once again, we return to this whole soil analogy. And what we're talking about is some sort of transformation, some sort of uh, a development from inside, nourishing something from inside ourselves, our heart, our mind, uh, the way we look at the world, the way we react to the world, something on in the inside of us, as opposed to something on the outside, like buying new things or changing the way we appear to others or uh, um, uh, trying to develop wealth in terms of uh, monetary wealth, right? All of these things are on the outside, not hidden. So instead, we see that the kingdom of heaven is something hidden. Maybe it's something inside. It's something within a person, right? And that nobody can take away from you, right? People can take away all your possessions. People can take away your money. Uh, you may even uh, lose limbs as a result of conflict. But what they can't take away is something within you, right? It's the, it's, it's the way you look at the world. It's the way you choose to respond to the world. It's your perspective, your point of view, your, your, um, uh, your ability to persevere, your ability to be resilient, right? That doesn't have anything to do with possessions. That's, that's something with having to do with your psychology. It's something having to do with your, with your heart, right? People take away all your possessions, but you can still be kind to others. People take away all, uh, you, you may um, uh, lose um, uh, physical uh, abilities over time because of age or because of, of um, uh, accidents you go through. But what they can't take away is they can't take away how you maybe are kind and compassionate to other people. Now, what we see in this last line, when a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought the field. Well, here he sold all he had. He gave away all of the external things in his possession, right? He gave away all that, that can be seen, all his, his clothing, his, his financial riches, uh, all the external sorts of things. This thing, this kingdom of heaven, is worth more than your externals. So we work so hard on a day-to-day -day basis, right, to change the circumstances of our lives, to buy the car, the house, to get the right spouse, to get the right clothing, to get the right haircut. Uh, we, 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 we spend a lot of money on making sure we get the right foods for our diet so that we look a certain way. We spend so much time at work in order to gain wealth and not just to buy the things, but to have status so that we appear a certain way to other people. And for a lot of us, a majority of our focus, majority of our time is spent on those sorts of activities, right? Gaining wealth, gaining material possessions, gaining status, improving how we look to other people. These are all, again, external. What we see here is that the kingdom of heaven is something beyond that, right? The kingdom of heaven is not something easily seen, not these external sorts of things, not the circumstances of our lives. The kingdom of heaven is something internal. It's worth much more than all of these external things. It gives us more joy 
than all these external things. So in uh, branch of psychology referred to as positive psychology, uh, uh, they, they study uh, human happiness. And what they've seen through their various studies on human happiness is that the way most people, especially in our Western culture, approach happiness may not really be the, the best, most efficient way. So a lot of us, what we think we need to do is we think we need to change the circumstances of our lives. Uh, many of us have this dream that if I just got the right job, I'd be happy. If I just got the right girl or boy, I'd, uh, boyfriend or girlfriend, husband or wife, I'd be happy. If I just got um, the right amount of money, right, I'd be happy. If I won the lottery, I'd be happy. And what they noticed was that when people uh, reach their goals and attain the things that they desire, there is a spike in people's level of, of, of perceived happiness. But over a period of time, that goes back down to baseline. It goes back down to how happy they were before getting the, the stuff. And you can take a look at your own closets and maybe your garages to see this. Right? You have all this material possessions that at one point may have made you happy, but over time, you went back down to baseline, and now these things are stuffed away in your closet and your garage. What they noticed was that instead of these sorts of conditions of our lives, what has a greater impact on our sense of well-being, what has a greater impact on our happiness, is how we think, is how we choose to respond to what happens to us. So we, can, we all experience hardship. We all experience moments where we say, why did this happen to me? So maybe you lost your job, right? Something external. Well, it's up to you and how you respond to that. It's up to you and how you think about that. Do you think about losing your job as, as uh, the, the, the end of your life, the end of your existence? When you lose your job, do you say, oh my goodness, I can't believe this happened to me. I, I'm no longer worthy of a good life. I must have done something wrong. My life is over now. Many people do that. Many people have that sort of response. But you can have a different response. You can think of this as an opportunity to do something different. You can think of this as a, as a, a way to explore new careers. Um, you can say to yourself, well, this is the closing of a chapter. Now it's on to the next one. It's up to us to determine what we choose to do with the circumstance, how we choose to respond to it. And that's an internal thing, right? Resiliency is an internal thing. What you choose to focus on in your life is an internal thing. Uh, every day, if you wanted to, you can focus on all the things you have to worry about. And a lot of us do that, right? Let's focus on the homework assignment. Let's do. Let's focus on the fact that my kid is sick. Let's focus on the fact that um, uh, my, my boss didn't like what I turned in the other day. Let's focus on the fact that the grocery store clerk wasn't very nice to me when I checked out my, my groceries. And a lot of times our mind does that. It focuses on all those things. But you don't have to. You have the choice, you have the ability to choose to focus on other things, to focus on all the things that are happening to you that are positive. Instead of worrying about all the bad stuff that happened the other day, what about all the positive things that occurred in your life? The fact that you're able to have maybe a meal, the fact that you're able to breathe, the fact that you're able to live in a region or an area where you have freedoms, freedoms to practice your own religion or to not practice religion, a freedom to walk the streets without having to be arrested for no cause. For the most part, right? That's a choice you can make for yourself. Again, that's an internal thing. It has nothing to do with the externals. It's an internal thing, how you choose to perceive your life, how you choose to react to the things that life throws at you. And according to what we see in the parable, this sort of internal thing, this internal kingdom is worth much more, gives you much more joy than attaining your devices or de getting a having the right sorts of clothing. Again, just one way of thinking about the parable. So imagine living in Judah at the time of Jesus, right? There, there, there's no form of media to pass along these teachings like the internet. There's no classes, uh, philosophy classes, comparative religions classes to learn about Jesus. What you know about Jesus is from your interactions with Jesus or from what you hear from people who have interacted with Jesus. If you heard him speak like this, if you heard him talk with these sorts of parables, if you saw the way he treated the, the unholy, if you saw how he treated the outcast of society, if you saw how he responded to the Jewish elite and, and, and calling them hypocrites, what would your impression of this individual be? 
how might you what might you think about this person well it seems for a lot of the followers that he speaks like a person with direct knowledge of truth there's not a, a sense of you know this could be how it is or um yeah, this might be a way to help you out. No, there's, there seems to or there seems to be a direct understanding of what's true of the world, of what's real. Um, and he speaks with these parables and with his um, with his sermons as if he knows it. it. Feels as if he knows it. It also you might get the sense that this is an individual that's not just passing on knowledge that they learn from someplace else. It feels as if you're speaking to an individual that has experienced this kingdom of heaven, that knows it firsthand, right? Uh, as opposed to an individual like a teacher or uh, some sort of instructor that maybe has studied this, read through some books, and is now trying to pass on what they learn through books. Um, we're talking about an individual that seems to have direct knowledge, direct experience of what they're talking about. It's as if Jesus himself has experienced the kingdom of heaven. And when we see that, when we see Jesus behave and the way he talks to the, the lepers, the way he interacts with the Pharisees and Sadducees, it seems as if, wow, this person has lived or is living in the kingdom of heaven. They know God directly. Therefore, for those that were around Jesus, he really did, he really did seem like the anointed one, right? He really did seem like the person that was anointed with oil, that was marked with oil, the Messiah, the Christ. So now, maybe if, if you're an individual living this time period, you go, now, finally, there's an individual here that knows. There's, there's a person here that's, that's like the prophets from our, from our, uh, from, from our ancient scriptures, from our, our history. Here is somebody speaking for God. So what we see from his followers as a result of this interaction is we see individuals that seem to radiate compassion. And uh, you'll, you can see in various other texts how Christians were, were kind of uh, looked upon as, as being strange in this way. Look at these Christians and how they, they love one another. Instead of focusing on the stress and anxiety that causes conflict between people, here are a group of individuals that are following this way of Christ, and they, 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 they seem to find a way to transcend this conflict. Uh, oftentimes because they're, strength, they're transcending the anxiety and stress of their of their lives and focusing more on communion, more on community, more on compassion and empathy for one another, more on for forgiveness. These people, even though they were still they they were living under the oppressive rule of the Jewish elite and of um, of the Roman Empire, they they seem to radiate joy even in spite of the dreariness of the external condition. Remember, we're talking about. The, the Middle East region here, We're talking about living in desolate areas under harsh conditions and, and heat. And uh, yet they seem to live joyfully. They seem to, to live with a, a, a spirit that, um, that, that makes them enthusiastic for life. And many people literally felt like they were saved. That even though they were persecuted because, you know, they were they were um, the, the early Christian followers were were a minority, right? The early Christian followers were people that deviated from the norm, so they were they were persecuted. But in spite of being persecuted, uh, these individuals felt like their lives were redeemed, felt like their lives were saved. Remember the idea of, um, of uh, the son who returns, and the idea of Jesus. Um, interacting and associating with with lepers and tax collectors and prostitutes um, these are people at the bottom of the barrel of society that were looked that were most looked down upon yet they felt enthused they felt redeemed they felt worthy because of what jesus taught that god will love them regardless that there is a kingdom for them beyond what they see on an everyday basis with normal perception right? there is a, a kingdom uh, it may be an internal kingdom, but a kingdom that they most truly belong to, one in which they are always loved, one in which uh, provides them more virtue and value in life than money, money or monetary possessions. So 
at the heart then, maybe, at the, at the heart of Jesus' teachings, we see um, his message centered on love. The Apostle Paul says uh, uh, the following, Love is patient, love is kind. Love is not envious or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes, should be all, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. And the Apostle Paul was um, an individual who helped spread the, um, the message of Jesus after Jesus' passing. The Apostle Paul would go around and help uh, establish various churches, wrote various letters to, um, to early churches, encouraging them. Uh, giving instructions to them, and the spread of Christianity is often attributed primarily to, or in a big part, to the Apostle Paul. And we see here within this expert, this excerpt, this um, uh, description of what love is. And, yeah, and maybe in, uh, if we, the idea being, the way of Jesus is focused on this, right? Focus on being patient. Focus on being kind. Focus on not being envious or arrogant or rude. As a result of following this way, maybe we could find our way back to the type of love or the type of life that God had intended for us, the type of relationship with God that was there at the beginning and that God wishes to have for us um, uh, even now, even while we make wrong decisions and go off the mark, right, even though we sin. So uh, as if in our next lecture, we'll talk a little bit about the spreading of this message, right? How did this uh, individual, Jesus, uh, how was he able to, um, to be the founder of the, the most popular religion the world has ever seen, in spite of the fact that obviously there's no internet, there's no, there's no uh, easy way of delivering his message. He had no army by which to, uh, at least at the time, he had no army by which to, to, to spread um, his teaching. So well, we'll talk a little bit about that when we come back in the next lecture.